If you're new with us, we are finishing uh, the book of 1 Peter today. Uh, it's been a great joy uh, during the last several weeks to work through this letter. Uh, so let's pray together, and I'll jump into this last section. Father, we thank you for the great privilege we have of studying your word today. As Peter has taught us, though we have not seen him, we love him and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We know we have not seen our Christ face to face, but that is the promise of Holy Scripture that we will. And one of the means of enduring in this life is by living on your word. So we pray you would, you would feed your people, strengthen your people today by your grace for that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we have been looking at this letter which talks a lot about suffering and hope. Those are kind of these, these two themes that go, uh, that, that kind of the rhythm of First Peter. And we conclude with that same emphasis here in the final chapter uh, of the letter. And we've talked about throughout our study that Peter envisions faithful Christian living in less than ideal circumstances. Uh, that there is nowhere where the gospel doesn't work. And there is no situation where we are uh, called to uh, forego obedience, that uh, these Christians are living in less than ideal circumstances, and we find ourselves in a different situation, but obviously in a less than ideal situation uh, as well. And we're called to stand firm in our faith. Uh, we're called to endure suffering in light of the great hope that we have in front of us. And today we add to the list of trials that we've already covered the topics of anxiety and our adversary. And so let's talk about your anxiety, your adversary, and your assurance, the great hope that you have in the midst of all of it. Now, Peter cites Psalm 55. I want to do something a bit different this morning. I'd actually, I want us to actually look at the, uh, Psalm 55 before we look at 1 Peter. Um, when Peter makes that, uh, that uh, important statement that we are to cast all of our anxieties on God because he cares for us, uh, he cites Psalm 55, verse 22. And I've mentioned this before, but whenever a New Testament writer cites an Old Testament verse, um, most agree that they have the entire chapter in mind, the context uh, where that verse sits in mind. And that's significant for the passage in front of us um, because this, this verse uh, in this context of Psalm 55 fits nicely with the context of 1 Peter. What I mean by that is this psalm, Psalm 55, is a psalm about suffering it's about affliction, it's about enemies, it's about the need for God's help, it's about the trustworthiness of God. In fact, the, the heading, which is not inspired, but is there by the translators, uh, in the ESV is cast your burden on the Lord. And this is a, a, a maskal of David, maskal means uh, uh, teaching, it's a, it's a psalm that teaches it's a psalm that teaches us how to endure suffering, how to present our cares upon God. And I, I think it would be uh, helpful and encouraging as we just scroll through Psalm 55 and bring all of that with us to 1 Peter. So he begins with, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. So there's a plea for help here. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan. I love the emotion of the psalms, don't you? How many of you have moaned lately? Yeah, you can identify. Because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. This desperation continues. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. So we've got fear, we've got trouble, we've got enemies, we've got the wicked, verse six. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away, I would lodge in the wilderness. So there's a desire to flee from the trouble, to flee from the enemies, to, to just get away from it. But he says, I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. You see, there is no shelter outside of God. Uh, we, we might think that if we could get out of a situation, uh, we, we, would, we would be okay, but the psalmist recognizes there's, there's nowhere to go. Our refuge is in God. Verse 9, destroy, O Lord, Lord, divide their tongues, that is, prevent them from working together. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst, oppression and fraud 
Do not depart from its marketplace. And the pain gets sharper now in verse 15 as even this, the psalmist's friends are opposed to him. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. This is one of his friends who is now opposed to him. He goes on to say, um, we used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let de- death steal over them and let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. And now this, ex- this expression of desperation and trust we read about in verse 16. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from old, because they do not change and do not fear God, my companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. He broke this solemn obligation that they had between each other. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. And then we arrive at verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. You take all of that burden, all of that affliction, all of those enemies, the betrayal of friends, and this mascal, this psalm is teaching us, what do we do when our heart is so conflicted like that? We cast our burden on the Lord, and he will sustain us. He will never permit the righteous to be moved, but you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days but I will trust you. Now bring all of that to 1 Peter chapter 5. This idea of trusting God, the the awareness of our enemies. And here in 1 Peter, the devil himself, who is out to afflict God's people and this call to rest in God's promises. So we think about your anxiety, your adversary, and your assurance. All three of these components, all three of these calls are really a call to simply trust God. And that's what Peter has been talking to us about, right? Entrust your soul to your faithful creator. Or chapter two, as Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Here at the end of the book, it's the same note. Trust God. Trust him. Cast your burden on him. He will sustain you. So if number one, dealing with your anxiety, how do we deal with it? Peter teaches us we deal with it by humble trust in our powerful and caring God. That's how we deal with it. Recall verse 5 as he says, humble yourselves, therefore, the therefore is a linking word back to the previous section where verse 5 ended with clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God gives grace to the humble. So the emphasis there is on humbling ourselves before one another, but now verse 6 is a humbling before God. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Humble yourselves under his hand. Now, this is an Old Testament image as well, particularly the the, uh, image that we find in the book of Exodus, where with God's mighty hand he brought Israel out. He is the redeeming God. He is the all-powerful God. And the verb here is a passive imperative. It is that is literally be humbled, be humbled under the mighty hand of God. And that's significant because I think what Peter has in mind here is this idea of accepting your situation as a state of humiliation, which is a good state, right? To, to humble yourself under God's mighty hand means to give yourself entirely to God and submit to the sovereign ordering of, your, of, of, of things, Uh, and not to protest against that. In in their case, it was to accept their lot as this marginalized group of believers. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. In the words of the hymn writer, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's humbling yourself under his mighty hand. Why? So that he may exalt you. In other words, when all is said and done, God will exalt the faithful. To Peter's audience, it's basically this. You guys seem like a small little minority who are being persecuted 
Don't worry about it. Your suffering is short term. God will exalt you later. He has the power to do this. His mighty hand will lift you up. This is speaking of this eschatological reversal. Those who are proud and arrogant and in control, in Peter's context, will one day be humbled. But those who are humbly following Jesus, submitting to God's sovereign plan and, and purposes, they will be exalted. Now notice how verse 7 is connected to verse 6. Casting all your anxieties. This is not a new sentence. This is a participle modifying verse 6, to explaining one of the ways in which we humble ourselves. And one of the ways we humble ourselves is by casting all of our anxieties upon God. In other words, failing, this is quite convicting. I see the notes before you hear it. Uh, <laughs> failing to give your anxieties to God is prideful and arrogant. Because what we're doing when we try to control these anxieties and deal with them ourselves is essentially take the place of the sovereign one. We want, we're, we're, we're trying to, to, to handle things better than God. We're not depending upon God. We're trying to control everything. You see, humility manifests itself in a person giving their anxieties to God. That's a humble person. Pride manifests itself in failing to give your anxieties to God. So it's a humble act of trust to cast your anxiety, your care upon God. So how do we get there? How, how can we do this more instinctively, more consistently? Well, I think the solution to that is found in this latter phrase, believing that he cares for you. Isn't this something? The mighty hand of God in verse 6, all powerful. And the same God also cares for you like a father. He is our father. Cast that anxiety. I'm sure no one in the room has any anxiety. No one online has any anxiety, right? This word anxiety is the same word that is used in Matthew 6 and Jesus' famous passage of, of not worrying as, as well as Philippians 4. And it's a word that means to be drawn in different directions. To be divided, to be distracted, to be conflicted. When we're anxious, we're being distracted from trusting God. Anxiety is pulling us in various directions so that we can't have single-minded confidence in God. So what do we do? We give it to God. I would love how the reformer Luther said it. Pray and let God worry. Give it to God for two reasons. He's all-powerful and he loves you. The God who parted the Red Sea says, give it to me. The God who gave up his own son says, give it to me. He's powerful and he loves us. He cares for us. Romans 8, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Cast your burden on the Father. Final note on verse 7, the verb here, or the participle rather, casting, this word means to literally throw something upon someone or something else. It's only used one other place in Luke 19, verse 35, where the disciples tossed their cloaks on, a, on the donkey as a saddle for Jesus. It's that idea of tossing, of, of casting. You might, you might think of fishing or a, a good game of cornhole, right, where you're, you're casting it. Or my favorite analogy would be bowling because that great sport of bowling is so fun to watch uh, for various reasons. But, but one of them is, have you ever noticed when someone throws the ball, how they try to control the ball after it's out of their hand? Right? No, they'll do a little the contortion of the body and they'll yell at the ball. The ball's paying no attention to your body after you let it go. Right? The, the secret to fun-filled bowling is just cast it. Just, just let it go. And it's that image here that we have in, uh, in 1 Peter. What book are we in? 1 Peter chapter 5. This idea of casting it upon the Lord. Now throw it down the lane. Let go of your burden and he will sustain you. It's the same idea that Paul mentions in Philippians 4 as he talks about relieving anxiety through prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, very important part of that, 
thanksgiving in the middle of that anxious prayer. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So how do we deal with this anxiety? Well, what Peter is instructing the Christians to do is to have a humble trust in God who is all-powerful and who loves us. Secondly, dealing with our adversary. He shifts here in verse 8 and teaches us to deal with our adversary by faith-filled resistance. Be sober-minded. So think clearly. Think clearly about the devil Realize you're in a war. This is uh, like the third or fourth time Peter's used this word, be sober-minded, this, this, this imperative. Don't ignore the times in which you're in. You're in a war. Be watchful, that is, be vigilant, be alert. Realize the devil hasn't taken a break during the pandemic. He doesn't do social distancing. He doesn't have a day off. He is always at work. And he is our adversary, your adversary the devil, diabolos, the devil means slanderer, accuser. That's what Satan loves to do. Sometimes he will use people to do that. He will divide Christians through words and accusations, slander, and so on. Satan loves to roar. You see this image here of a, of a lion who is, is prowling about. He wants to devour Christians. And we read in Revelation chapter 12 that he's raging because he knows his days are short. You see, the thing about Satan is he is a defeated foe. Jesus said before the cross, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Satan is a sore loser, and he's seeking to destroy your faith. He wants to divide the church. The devil uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2 is, is said to be the one who is persecuting the church. And here, Peter says he is roaring. What does that mean? That means he wants us to, to cave in fear. That's, that's the devil's job, to make you afraid, to make you anxious. How, how much different the devil than the father here? One is roaring, wanting to scare you, wanting to devour you. The other is eager to hear you and take your anxiety. And so he wants to make us afraid, especially in the time of trials. And here in Peter's context, that would obviously mean persecution. And he's saying, don't fear. Don't fear the roar because we know a better lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who reigns over all. So he says, watch out, be sober-minded. He wants to destroy your faith. He doesn't he doesn't tell us specific, I keep saying destroy your faith, because he just says he wants to devour you. But if we take verse 9 with verse 8, I think we, we get the idea that he wants to destroy faith. See verse 9 when he says, resist him, firm in your faith. So the danger is your faith. Resist him because he wants to destroy your confidence in God. You see that? He wants to destroy your trust in God. So resist him, stand firm in your faith. Do not let Satan's roar rob you of peace, of hope, of life. Resist him. Now, that sounds a lot like James, doesn't it? Not my son, James, but the book of James, where he says that same thing when he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you, which means you have power to resist him. You have the power to say no to temptation, to say no to crippling fear, to say no to all his schemes. And we're reminded from Ephesians 6 that the devil has many schemes, many schemes. Over in uh, Germany, you can visit the castle where Luther translated the Bible, and there, there are said to be ink stains on the wall where he threw the inkwell at the devil. He said he, he sensed warfare so much in translating the Bible that he was throwing the inkwell uh, at the evil one. Some of you may be doing that right now with online education, right? <laughs> Wanting to throw your computer at the devil. Um, but don't cave in. He's saying, remain steadfast. Now, there's several ways, and we don't have time to get into a, a whole theology of spiritual warfare, but really quickly, how do you resist him? How do you stand firm? Scripture speaks of things like prayer, taking up the sword of the Spirit. This is how 
that Jesus did when he was tempted in the garden, right? Or in the wilderness by Satan. Using the scriptures. Being in community is one of the ways we resist him and stand firm in the faith. Isolated people can be very easy prey. Faithful obedience it's through these means by which we're, we're strong, by which we can stand firm. And so you have the power to resist him. When you're tempted to go to that website, just rehearse in your mind, resist the devil. When you're tempted to lash out in anger, put it in your mind, resist the devil. When you're tempted to doubt God's provision, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We see that sort of thing illustrated in the wilderness with Jesus and the devil. At the end of it, in Matthew 4, Matthew says, then the devil left him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, it doesn't mean he was, good, he was gone for good, but that intense moment was alleviated. And Luke adds an, a component to it when he writes about it in Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So in these moments, we're prayed up, we've got scripture, we believe God's promises that we can overcome in these times. And we, we, we overcome also understanding that we are victors with the great promise of Romans 16 verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. All of the schemes will eventually be over. He is a defeated foe and he will be a vanquished foe. He then gives more encouragement at the end of verse 9. The fact that other believers around the world are suffering, that they are also dealing with this roaring lion, serves as an encouragement. He says, knowing, knowing this, resist the devil, or resist him firm in the faith. As you're resisting him, as you're standing firm in the faith, be aware of the fact that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Now, how, how does this encourage us? How did it encourage them? I, mean, I think there are several things we could say, but one, it reminds us, as we think about the brotherhood around the world, the church around the world, that we're not alone, we're not isolated, and we're not suffering in some strange way. But it's normal Christianity. You hop on a plane and go to Nigeria, you see it. You hop on a plane and go to Australia, you see it. You see, you see Christians dealing with Sin and suffering, dealing with a roaring lion, enduring persecution and hostility in many places. It also reminds us that when we're united to Jesus Christ, we're also joined to the family of God around the world. That's a remarkable thing to ponder. And it inspires hope. For the, the spread of persecution points to the nearness of the consummation to come. Glory awaits the suffering church. They, they, they will be glorified. And so Peter wants them to, to be reminded, hey guys, you, 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 you are identified with the church. They were experiencing the very similar thing to you. You're not alone. You're not isolated. It's not strange. And this suffering, notice I love how he says, verse 10, you've suffered for a little while. <laughs> that's, that's what he opened the book with. Remember that in, in chapter one? That though you've suffered now for a little while, which we noted is like 70 years for an average person if we get to live that long. Some of you already passed it, so you've had a little extra little while. But when you look at your suffering in light of eternal glory, it's a little while. And that takes us to, to verses 10 and 11, resting in your assurance. So again, with Peter, suffering and hope, suffering and hope. The, the trials we have, the anxiety, give it to God. The devil who wants to devour our faith, resist him firm in the faith. And now he ends the section by reminding us of God's saving purposes. He finishes essentially where he started, with the amazing grace of God. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace. What a picture of God in these few verses. The mighty hand of God who redeems out of Egypt. The one who cares for you. And now he's the God of all grace. Who has called you? This is our hope. We've been called. We have been called to belong to Jesus Christ, and we have been called to his eternal glory. Called to eternal glory in Christ. That's why the suffering, as bad as it might be, 
can seem like just a thimble in light of the ocean of eternal glory that is to come. He's called us to glory. Our call to salvation was a calling to glory. In Christ, he will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He notes four things that God will do there for the faithful. All four of these verbs are in the future tense, assuring us of what God will do. He, and I love how he says, himself. Not a mediating agent, but God himself, who called us to glory in Christ, will restore us. I love this picture. This is a word it means to repair. It's like, or to relocate or uh, or fix a dislocated bone or it's used to restore fishing nets. Peter knew about restoration, didn't he? He knew it very well from experience. And he's saying, in the future, God will fully restore us in new creation. Suffering for a little while now, fully repaired and restored in the future. He will confirm, this is a word that means to establish or permanently fix. We are, have a firm position in Christ, and we will have that forever. He will strengthen us, a verb only used here in the New Testament. Job uses this in the Greek version of the Old Testament to speak of the strength of a lion. And here he's saying we have full strength in Christ. We will have full strength in new creation where there's no sickness and death anymore. He will fully strengthen all of us. And he will establish us. He will set a firm foundation for us. It speaks of our security. So while we suffer a little bit now, while we have this enemy, while we have troubles and afflictions and we're tempted to anxiety, we set our eyes on glory. We set our eyes on the fact that God will restore us. He will establish us, confirm us, strengthen us. Naturally then to him goes the praise. God does the saving, God does the calling, God does the restoring, God does the strengthening, God does the confirming, God does the establishing, and therefore God gets the glory. To him be the dominion forever and ever. And all God's people say, amen. Final greetings, verse 12. By Silvanus, most believe this was the longer version of Silas' name, the companion of Paul and also of Peter who's likely here, um, either the secretary or the letter carrier, doesn't really matter uh, for our purposes today, but he's a faithful brother as I regard him. I have written briefly to you, and here Peter, as we've said, has told us what he's been talking about the entire time. The true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I've been teaching you basic Christianity. I've been teaching you reminding you of the gospel, about the true grace of God. Stand firm in it, don't depart from it. A big emphasis in the next letter will be false teaching and the danger of falling away from the true grace of God, but stand firm in it. And then Peter sends greetings from the church where he's writing from, Rome, and he, 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 he says it in a very uh, interesting way, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings And so does Mark, my son. Some of you ladies may want to sign your letters like this at the end of your little emails, you know. She who is at Babylon greets you. Now, this is a reference to the church in Rome. She, her, bride, church, Babylon, reference to exile, a reference to um, not being at home in this world. So the letter ends the way it begins. Remember how it began with, to those who are elect exiles, In modern day Turkey, they're chosen in the Lord. They're not at home in this world. Here, the same is true for the church in Rome. The same thing was true for the church in Turkey. That we are chosen and we're not at home. And it's a good reminder for us that we are not living in the new Jerusalem. We are like exiles in Babylon. This world is not our home. We are chosen in the Lord. He has brought us to himself. And you see the connection between the churches as well. They send greetings as does Mark, my son. This was the same John Mark that we read about most likely throughout um, the biblical narrative who had become now a loyal partner to Peter. And you can sense the affection at the end of this letter as Peter calls Mark his son. And then more affection, greet one another with the kiss of love. Now, you single people, don't get too excited about this. Okay, let's temper it a little bit. 
I, I don't even know how we do this now uh, without breaking a bunch of laws. Uh, greet one another with a holy elbow, with a, <laughs> with a holy head nod. Now, uh, we as uh, Westerners are probably not as, you know, into this sort of thing as others are. As I think I told you before, one translator in the Phillips translation, who was an English guy, British guy, he called it uh, a holy handshake all around. That's what he called it. But whatever you, whatever you make of it here, it is this idea that the church is a place of warmth and affection. It's a kiss of love. It's called a holy kiss and uh, in Romans, but here it's a kiss of love. There's, there is love. There's tenderness. And Peter ends this letter with peace to all of you who are in Christ. My friends, we're going to go through many trials in this life. We're going to suffer for a little while. But in the midst of the suffering and the trials, there's peace. And that peace is made possible because we're in Christ. If we're in Christ, we're in peace. It is well with our souls. Though the storms are all around us, we have peace in him. So deal with your anxiety through a humble trust in God. Deal with your adversary through faith-filled resistance. And rest in your assurance. Rest in the assurance that the God of all grace will bring your salvation to completion. All of this is made possible because we're in Christ. As the hymn writer in 1653 wrote, Jesus, priceless treasure, source of purest pleasure, truest friend to me, ah, how long in anguish shall my spirit languish, yearning, Lord, for thee. Thou art mine, O Lamb divine. I will suffer not to hide thee, not I ask beside thee. In thine arms I rest me. Foes who would molest me cannot reach me here. Though the earth be shaking, every heart be quaking, Jesus calms my fear. Lightnings flash and thunders crash, yet though sin and hell assail me, Jesus will not fail me. Satan, I defy thee. Death, I now decry thee. Fear, I bid thee cease. World, thou shalt not harm me, nor thy threats alarm me, while I sing of peace. God's great power guards every hour. Earth and all its depths adore him. Silent, bow before him. Let's pray together. Father, what peace we have in your great presence. We pray that we would have a humility that leads us to accept our lot and leads us to cast all our cares upon you. May we never doubt your care, never doubt your power. Give us faith, help us not to cower in fear when the devil roars. Help us to remain confident in the grace that you have given us in Christ Jesus. Set our gaze, we pray, on eternal glory as we deal with the trials and tribulations of this short life. Jesus, we know at the end of the day, our assurance is not that we're holding you, but you're holding us, that our Christ will not fail us. Increase our faith, we pray, in Jesus' good name. Everybody said, amen.